everyone, I'm John Fenzel, and you know, like all of us, I've been thinking about the current health environment and what's been helpful, at least for me, is to look at what's been effective in the past when we faced situations just like this. And it's been over a century since our nation last experienced a massive pandemic on this scale. And so I think it's instructive, at least, to take a step back and consider that response as we deal with the coronavirus, there's a really compelling story of how the people of Dayton, Ohio, led by one doctor, were able to effectively stem the pandemic influenza of 1918 in their own city. And it's a story of how one city devised and managed and responded to a public health crisis of really just epic proportions. Now, to do this, you have to go back a long time, before our lifetimes, to our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents' time. It was the late summer of 1918, and World War I was approaching its conclusion, and the people of Dayton, Ohio, like the rest of the country, were transfixed to all of the newsreels from the front. In September of 1918, at a military camp near Chillicothe, Ohio, 18 men fell ill from violent flu-like symptoms, and they died quickly. Red Cross nurses responded immediately. There was no drug regimen or procedure for treating what later would become known as the Spanish flu, except for warm food, warm blankets, fresh air, and yes, what they called even then, tender loving care. By October, the disease had spread outside the military camps, and as the pandemic widened, the government and local authorities took all possible measures to stop its spread. the Navy's Department of Sanitation delivered a whole set of warnings that included measures like protect yourself from infection, keep well, don't get hysterical over the epidemic, beware of those who are coughing and sneezing, avoid crowded streetcars and walk to the office if possible, keep out of crowds, avoid theaters and moving picture shows and other places of public assembly, don't travel by railroad unless absolutely necessary. Now, just think about that. They didn't have airports then, but even then, the social distancing with rail transportation was, even then, considered insufficient. And there's more. Don't drink from glasses or cups that have been used by others. Avoid close, stuffy, and poorly ventilated rooms. Stay at home and try not to go to work if you're sick. And then boil handkerchiefs and keep away from others because back then, of course, they didn't have Kleenex. So over time, just like today, the influenza pandemic quickly gained daily front page coverage in the Dayton Daily News along with the news of the war. Articles about the number of current and new cases, deaths, and recommended methods people could employ to limit the spread of the flu were commonplace. The newspapers also included ads for products to treat influenza symptoms. One man at the front lines and battling the pandemic was Dr. A.O. Peters, Dayton's health commissioner. He saw the first signs of the influenza pandemic and immediately began his own personal crusade to calm Dayton's populace. At the outset, Peters began organizing the city to combat the spread of the virus. He launched an information campaign that was nothing less than a plea to the people of Dayton for a measured, deliberate response, and his message contained two warnings. The first warned about the danger in becoming complacent, while the second urged people not to become panicked. He spoke in clear, easily understood terms, and he sought more to educate than to warn. They were simple steps every family could take. The, the most important step was to follow the basic tenets of personal hygiene. the public that most of the cases in Dayton were due to the negligence of people that when they or another family member world didn't take the proper precautions to keep the disease from spreading. He claimed that the deaths so far were caused by pneumonia which developed because the patient returned to normal activities too soon. 
He recommended that anyone suspected of contracting the disease should be isolated from the rest of the family. Only one other person who should wear a gown and a mask when entering the room should attend to that patient, and this person should wash his or her hands after leaving the room. He indicated that people were becoming unnecessarily frightened, and he wanted them to understand that some simple precautions and sanitary measures could protect them from the disease. Despite the best efforts of Dr. Peters and the city government, the number of influenza cases continued to rise not only in Dayton, but across the country. On October 10th, 1918, faced with a rampant and deadly epidemic, the Ohio State Department of Health required that influenza be classified as a reportable disease to the federal government. Every evening, the number of deaths and in influenza cases for that day were sent to the state health office. State health officials consolidated the data from these letters around the state and delivered a comprehensive report to Washington, D.C. by telegraph the following day. The system was implemented throughout the country and provided Washington officials with regular updates on the status of the influenza pandemic throughout the United States. So with the realization that the epidemic was still spreading in Dayton, Dr. Peters ordered all public gathering spots, schools and theaters and churches and saloons, soda fountains, pool rooms, all of them closed. The order was extended to all the places where non-essential activities were carried on and where many people were congregating. He later permitted some establishments to reopen with the sole purpose to sell goods and services, but he prohibited any mass congregation of folks. Dr. Peters issued a warning for all establishments that their patrons must keep moving. Saloons could only sell bottled drinks, but even those had to be consumed elsewhere. Ice cream couldn't be sold in cones, and nothing could be eaten on the premises. Freestanding drinking fountains that allowed water to fall back onto its source were also closed. Those shops that didn't conform to Dr. Peter's directives were cited and they were closed. Restrictions even applied to those who died from the illness. All funerals of influenza victims could only be attended by immediate relatives and all caskets had to remain closed unless they were covered by a glass shield. In addition to all these restrictive measures, some targeted permissive measures were also implemented in the widespread belief that fresh air was one of the best preventatives of the disease. The long-standing wartime ban on the use of gasoline on Sundays was withdrawn to encourage people to go for drives on Sunday. In early December, Dr. Peters issued an order closing the grade schools again because of an increase in the number of cases in grade school children. He also declared children under 14 to be forbidden from any public place. While the children enjoyed an extended holiday vacation, they couldn't spend their time paying a visit to Santa because of the ban and a decree that no department store or church or school Santas would be allowed that year. A notable development maybe as a result of those measures taken was that no influence of deaths were reported on Christmas Day. On New Year's Eve, all restrictions were removed except the one on the use of confetti during holiday celebrations. Children under 14 could now go to public places again and school recommenced on January 6th and that effectively ended all the bans on school attendance. With the official reopening of all the schools and all the restrictions lifted on gathering in public places, Dr. Peters proclaimed victory in checking the epidemic in the city. And while there would still be some lingering cases and deaths, there would be no further need for any bans or limitations. And if the estimated influenza cases in Dayton are correct, it's probable that an estimated one-third of the population contracted the disease. The national impact is put into modern context when we consider that the influenza pandemic of 1918 killed about 500,000 Americans, more than all of the 20th century wars combined. Its three deadliest months were September, October, and November of that year. During October alone, nearly 200,000 people died in this country. 
despite the terrible impact of the pandemic on Dayton, Dr. Peters still recognized an indirect benefit from the experience, noting that the epidemic had resulted in a campaign of education intended to teach the people the need of ventilation and better sanitary conditions and the really fearful results of overcrowding in addition to the responsibility for one's own health. In fact, the efforts of Dr. Peters and the Dayton health officials not only contributed to the halt of the disease, but it also led to a whole new awareness of the importance of personal hygiene as a method of prevention. At the end of the day, Detonians overcame the problems caused by the epidemic through a combination of education and commitment and cooperation. So we'll stop there. We'll just make that part one of probably what will be about a three-part series talking about the Spanish influenza and the pandemic of 1918. Uh, we'll talk about some more lessons learned, and we'll also talk about some leadership lessons that can be derived from the flu epidemic of 1918. So there you have it, a little historical perspective. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay well. I'm John Fenzel, and I thought you'd like to know.